All right, good afternoon, and um, thanks for clicking on to the uh, Wednesday edition of Vogue's European Outlook. Slightly different today. If you can hear background noise and it sounds my voice sounds a little bit weird, it's actually because this has been recorded inside a warehouse, and you know the time is actually twenty past midnight. But I wanted to take this opportunity just to look at a couple of different things today, rather than just the kind of day to day doldrums. Uh, before we continue with the video. Remember, you can check me out on Facebook as well as that. You can check out um, my daily updates on Twitter. And, of course, be sure to go on to marfoganweather.com online. There is the October Outlook. There is also a recap of what took place during the month of September as well. And, of course, we are going to continue to um, look more and more at the upcoming winter season and the interesting aspects that go into looking at a forecast here. I want to touch a little bit on El Nino here. There's a few tweets here that's been produced by World Climate Service, which is find very interesting. Some September statistics with regards to both en ENZO, which is um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and the IOD, the Indian Ocean Dipole. Now, we of course look at the various Nino regions and the temperature compared to normal. And of course, we do have a fully fledged um, El Nino in place. We will continue to see the atmosphere hook up with the warm ocean of the Pacific um, equatorial region. And of course, we will then see what kind of response that has both on the Manjulian Oscillation and also the Northern Hemispheric Pattern. At this very moment in time, if I'm being honest, there is a lot of confliction between some of the long-range model output and what the climate drivers are suggesting at this moment in time. So in other words, there is elements where it's looking unfavorable for a cold upcoming winter but yet the long range models indicate some pretty strong high latitude blocking um, as we push particularly through the middle and second half of the of the winter season coming up here so i want to specifically look at a couple of aspects today this isn't quite the winter update number two but um it, it certainly is uh, a discussion with regards to what I'm seeing so far here. So uh, the Nino region 3.4 is plus 1.6 above average, which is the fourth highest on record. And Nino region 1.2, which is the area closest to South America, is at plus 2.5 above average. So that's second highest only to 1997. So that would indicate that is actually warmer than it was uh, in this region of the Pacific anyway, warmer than 2015, which of course is the last um, Super El Nino. N Nino region four is at 1.1 um, Celsius above average, which uh, is actually the highest on record. The Madoki index is minus 0 0.24, and that would suggest not at all a Madoki-like set up yet so of course a Madoki El Nino is what you would typically want to see if for a favorable state to produce both high latitude blocking in the right areas and also colder conditions the Enzo longitude index is now fifth highest since 1950 now the Indian Ocean Dipole is an interesting one it's at plus 2.1 celsius which is the fourth highest positive IOD or Indian Ocean Dipole on record here. Now there is some comparisons to the speed at which it's becoming strongly positive. Um, in comparisons to 2019, which I believe is considered a record strong positive IOD. Now I've already made mention of two things. Uh, strong El Nino with warmest waters against the South American coast would typically override the system, produce more of an Atlantic-driven mild winter across Europe and the UK and Ireland. A Madogi-style El Nino would be more favourable. Now, the Indian Ocean Dipole 
there is linkage that suggests a very strong, the very strong positive IOD that was uh, um, set back in 2019. Now, there is some studies or some evidence that has suggested, at least, I don't know how, how true it actually is, but there's some suggestions that the linkage between the positive IOD and the super strong polar vortex, which drove a very mild, very unsettled, middle and particularly second half of the 2019 2020 winter was down to that very strong positive indian ocean dipole now of course i've made mention of the uh, the um the uh, <laughs> my mind's just went blank the man julian oscillation which of course is in ha uh, active inactive uh, enhanced upward motion tropical um, enhancement of um, convection over a particular region of the equatorial planet and you typically find where that area of uh, of strong convection sets up can also have impact now the el nino can have impact in the man julian oscillation and the man julian oscillation can uh, can have impact on the upper air pattern and the type of amplification you find over the mid to high latitudes during the um, you know summertime, but it also during the winter time as well. Now we I do believe, according to our friend Gavin Partridge, uh, through his winter updates, has made mention that the twenty twenty three summer was the fifth or fourth most negative North Atlantic oscillation summer on record, and I think the record dates back to nineteen fifty. It's quite interesting that we had a very strong uh, negative NAO summer back in 2009, and we know, of course, what followed that. But it's going to be interesting to see. Now, the water temperatures around the planet, uh, you know, net temperature is warmest on record. Um, World Climate Service also says that the AMO, or the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation, is at 0 0.9 Celsius above average, the highest on record by far. That has to get taken into consideration. The PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, is at minus 1.7. The third, interesting enough, the third most negative since 1950. Astonishing to see during an El Nino. Now this could, so this is actually the that ribbon of uh, below average sea surface temperatures, which you can see here. So you can see here, by far, this is uh, Nino region 1.2. The very warm sea surface temperatures up against the South American coast. We've got a very warm Gulf of Mexico. We've got a very warm North Atlantic as well. But this cooling over the Gulf of Alaska and just to the west of uh, Canada is quite interesting. That's been growing in recent times. And this ribbon of colder than average waters extending from off the Baja of California across the southern flank of the uh, Hawaiian Islands. Uh, this uh, is, I believe, the you know the hallmark of that negative PDO, and there, it's quite unusual to get a, a firmly negative PDO, which is the areas of of cooler than average water north of the equator over the Pacific. It's interesting. It's unusual to get that with a very uh, you know a, a strong moderate to strong, if that makes sense, um, El Nino here. So there's a bit of confliction here. This could be a side effect, by the way, of the three-year La Nina um, in the Pacific here. So interesting times. You can see the cooling, increased cooling around Indonesia and Australia. That, of course, is the positive um, IOD, warmest waters, um, central and western portions of the Indian Ocean here. Now, what you would want to see is uh, for a cold winter, that warm water peeling away from South America, so cooling up against the South American coast warming over the central pacific ocean get that warmest waters here you increase the upward motion over the central pacific that then in turn has a different walker circulation compared to what it would be with the warmest waters against the south american coast now if we go back to the world climate service um tweets here some other interesting aspects to consider and um, we have got september and SSTs um, show anomalies of plus two Celsius in the eastern tropical Pacific, strong El Nino, the northwest Pacific record heat in Japan, 
the Arctic Barren Sea region as well, which is quite interesting. Now, if we scroll down here, there is some confliction. So the strong positive IOD and the current state of the El Nino, in my opinion, does not support a particularly great winter for high latitude blocking and cold conditions, both in North America and in Europe. But this interesting tweet here, going back to the 30th of September, shows that the latest CANSIPS loses most of the Greenland blocking during December, but keeps a strong block during January and February. Now, Madoki El Ninos tend to have uh, cold mid and second halves to winter, so it's, in other words, back-loaded winters. You can see here a slight um, positive over the North Atlantic and Greenland, the trough over Europe, the trough over North America. You can see how it increases in intensity during January uh, and also during the month of February, even stronger in February compared to, uh, to, to January, which is very, very interesting indeed. Okay, so I've been shifted slightly more and there is a radio playing in the background. I hope that isn't uh, going to cause any issue with regards to hearing what I've got to say. Back to the El Nino stuff. Uh, this is a tweet here back on September 21st. Again, from World Climate Service, indicating a, from a big picture perspective, the climb in the Nino region 3.4 sea surface temperature anomalies has been quite relentless in, since late last year. Now, remember, there has been... Uh, the building of warmth over the equatorial Pacific, especially across the far eastern equatorial Pacific, but the atmosphere has still resembled a, a La Nina type uh, base state here. So we've had some confliction. Right, mate. Cheers. There's nobody else coming in anyway, is there? I'm just going to finish something quickly and then I'll get it seated up. All right, mate. Thanks. Okay, I went through this far too much, but I didn't realize that I didn't pause the video there. So I do apologize for that. I'm sure that will make a few people giggle. But anyway, this uh, so obviously the, the ocean has been resembling a, a pretty strong, pretty firm El Nino east based, but the atmosphere has not resembled the uh, El Nino base state. But it looks as if we're starting to see that taking place. So the warming has been relentless we've had a warming of, of 2.5 celsius of an anomaly over the last 10 months this is not unusual as a major el nino emerges in 1997 nino region 3.4 rose 3 celsius in 10 months in 2009 it rose 2.5 celsius which of course is about on par with what we've got at the moment here so very very interesting stuff indeed may i add with regards to the El Nino. Finally, the Arctic. I want to talk a little bit about the Arctic. So despite the fact that we have had a lot of warmth globally, especially over the Northern Hemisphere, and you know, without a doubt, the Southern Hemisphere as well, but looking back at the Arctic summer, several areas were more than two Celsius warmer than normal, most notably Northern Canada, relatively cool around Baffin Bay and Far East Russia here. Which that, that trough that's been lingering over Far East Russia may have a little bit of a negative um, influence on potential high latitude blocking. But again, there's a little bit of confliction with that one with regards to a Far East Russia trough and um, the, a, a slight linkage between a possible uh, positive North Atlantic uh, oscillation winter here. Um, so summer temperatures are always near normal um, over the high Arctic Ocean, um, constrained by seasonal ice melt. Now, I believe the Arctic has seen the sixth lowest ice extent um, on record, which is quite interesting, actually, given the amount of warmth um, throughout the Northern Hemisphere, isn't it? So the sixth least Arctic ice within the Arctic region during the summer of 2023. So this is really just a kind of off the cuff ideas thinking that um, I wanted to share with you. Let me know in the comment section below what you think with regards to what I've mentioned. And we'll look at this in a bit more detail in the coming days to come as well. So winter update number two coming up.
Please like, share, and subscribe. See you again tomorrow with more.